It's great to see you this morning. Great to be together for worship. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. John, chapter 11. I want to talk for a few minutes about, yes, Jesus loves you. John, chapter 11. While you find your way there, there's an old Sunday school song. You know it. It says, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yes, Jesus loves me. I want you to sing it together while we're finding our way to John chapter 11. Thank you, Pastor Jason. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Thank you so much, Pastor Jason. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, worship team. Didn't they do a great job today leading us in the presence of the Lord? John chapter 11, going to start reading in verse 17 while you find your way there. A couple of quick things. First of all, during this season of Lent leading up to Easter, we're sharing a book together called Magnificent Obsession by Brian Kim. Uh, a lot of you have picked up a copy of this book, have been reading along with us. I've been getting messages from a number of you who are just really blessed by the book. If you haven't gotten there yet, chapter four of this book is thebomb.com. It's an it's a awesome, beautiful chapter. Um, if you haven't had a copy and you'd like to get one and follow along with us, you can pick up a copy on the back table in the back of the sanctuary. We're asking you to contribute $15 towards the cost of the book, which is our price. We got these for $14.99 on Amazon, and uh, we paid for the shipping to get a couple hundred copies here to you. And we just wanna, we're not making any money, but we wanna bless you with it. It's a great book, and perhaps you'd like to get it and use it as a devotional over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're only in chapter three of the book today, so you don't have too much reading to do to catch up, and you can follow along with us for the next few weeks. Uh, until we celebrate Easter together. The other thing I wanted to let you know is that at 6 o'clock tonight, we'll be having a membership class for people who would like to join and become officially members of our congregation. We have about 60-something people that have signed up for a membership class, and uh, we praise the Lord for that. And uh, at this point, the more the merrier if you'd like to join us. Uh, we actually have so many people, we're going to start downstairs and have some hors d'oeuvres at 6 and then we're going to come up here to the sanctuary as soon as our Spanish congregation has finished their worship service uh, so that we can have seats for everybody. But if you'd like to become a member of Harvest Time, you can come to class tonight at 6 o'clock. It's just one night only, and you can check out what it means to be a member. All right, look with me in John chapter 11. I'm going to start reading in verse 17. This is the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. You might remember that uh, Lazarus took sick. And uh, the family sent for Jesus to come quickly. Uh, and Jesus delayed a little bit. And this is what happens when Jesus arrives. John 11, beginning in verse 17. It says, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. 
Martha answered, I know he will rise again at the resurrection in the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who is to come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, and he's calling you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and ran to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. That's the shortest verse in the entire Bible. And I would submit to you this morning one of the most profound verses in the entire Bible. I want you to say those words with me if you would. Jesus wept. Would you say it again? Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? We won't read the end of the story, but of course, you know that Jesus did raise Lazarus out of the tomb, which was perhaps the greatest miracle of his earthly ministry. Let's pray, and we want to invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister to us. And my prayer for you is that you would have a collision with the love of God this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus, your only son, Father, I pray that we would have a collision with your love this morning. I pray that we would experience your love as we receive your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. During this season of Lent, we've invited you to join us on a quest that begins with a question. Jesus posed the question. He said, what about you? Who do you say that I am? When Jesus posed that question to the disciples, he was not asking a historical question. He was not asking a religious question or a philosophical question. I would submit to you that he wasn't even necessarily asking a theological question. Jesus was asking a personal question, a relational question, an intimate question. What about you? Who am I to you? What's our connection? How are we related? Whom do you perceive me to be in relationship to yourself? Am I a friend? Am I a brother? Am I a boss? Am I a life coach? Am I a savior? And what am I like to you? You know, Jesus is still looking for a personal response from each one of us. Who am I to you? Let me ask you something. When you close your eyes and you think about Jesus, what comes to your mind? Is Jesus a distant stranger to you or is he a familiar friend? Is Jesus a mysterious guru-like figure or is he someone easy for you to relate to? You know, for so many people, their image of Jesus is based more on Hollywood portrayals of him rather than their own personal discovery of him through reading the Gospels and through prayer. But what about you? What is Jesus like in your thoughts? What is his disposition towards you? The great preacher A.W. Tozer said, what comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And it's true. Our concept of God defines us. 
By some secret law of the soul, we tend to move toward our idea of God. Our concept of God shapes us. It shapes our values and our priorities. It shapes our moral character. It shapes our behavior. And how we envision God determines whether we are drawn to run into his arms or whether we're driven to run away from him. You know, when it comes to God's love, I think a lot of us struggle to really believe that God loves us as much as he does. If you've spent any time at all around church, the love of God is probably one of the first things that you were taught. Even people who are totally unchurched quip, God is love. And it's true. Loving is not merely something God does. Love is the very essence of whom he is. God is love. Even people who are totally unchurched quip that God loves all people unconditionally. And it's true. The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. That means that God does not discriminate based on race or gender or ethnicity. That God loves us is something that we have been taught. But the Bible says that this is a truth that must be caught rather than taught. In other words, rather than merely knowing that God loves us in our minds, we need help from God to believe that he loves us in our hearts. The Apostle Paul said that we need the Holy Spirit to reveal God's love to our heart. So that rather than just being a factoid in our brain, God's love is something that we actually experience. We actually feel loved by him and that changes everything. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul prays a prayer for us. He prays, I continually ask the Father to give you the Holy Spirit to help you to know the Father better. I continuously pray that the eyes of your heart would be opened so that you might know these things by experience. What things? Well, Paul goes on. He says, I continuously pray that the Holy Spirit would give you strength in your innermost being so that you might have the power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to experience this love in a way that surpasses knowledge. What is Paul praying for us? He's praying that the Holy Spirit would come to us and he would help us so that God's love is not merely something we've been taught, but it's something that we've actually caught. So that it's not merely a point of information in our heads, but that it's something we've actually experienced and we keep on experiencing. The truth is we know God loves us in our head but we struggle to believe it in our heart. And it's mostly because we were raised by parents who loved us in their own human imperfection. So we wrestle with worry that perhaps God disapproves of us. We fear that God is angry with us. We feel that we need to perform in order to win his approval or to get his attention. Jesus loves me, this I know, but do I believe it in my heart? Last week we started talking about a woman named Mary from the village of Bethany. In the Gospels we have three snapshots of her life. Pastor Nick shared with us last week the first snapshot taken at her sister's house. Martha, her sister, was one of those performance-driven people trying to catch Jesus' attention by being the hostess with the mostest. Yes. Meanwhile, Mary sat at Jesus' feet, hanging on his every word. And from that snapshot, we found out what God values most from us. What God values most from us is not our frenzied efforts to impress him with our service, but he enjoys simply when we enjoy his presence as much as we can. Amen. Beloved, listen to me. The point of following Jesus is not to be as busy as you can with church stuff. 
The point of following Jesus is to spend as much time as you can cultivating a personal relationship with him through personal worship and prayer and study of his word. John chapter 11 gives us the second snapshot of Mary. This time she's grieving at her brother's tomb. Lazarus had taken sick and the family sent for Jesus to come at once. But Jesus purposely delayed coming to them until Lazarus had died. This was going to be an occasion for God the Father to be glorified and for Jesus' identity to be further revealed through the greatest miracle of his earthly ministry. But when Jesus arrived and he saw Mary's grief and he saw the grief of her friends, Jesus wept. In that first snapshot of Mary, we learn what God values from us. But in this second snapshot, we learn how much God values us. This second snapshot of Mary teaches us that, yes, Jesus loves us. Why did Jesus weep? You know, it's an interesting question. And it's one that gets harder to answer the more closely you look at these verses. From the time that Jesus heard of Lazarus' sickness, Jesus already knew how this whole thing was going to play out, and he knew what the outcome was going to be. Jesus already knew that Lazarus was going to die, and he knew that the Father's intention was to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus knew that in just a few more minutes, Mary's grief and the grief of the others was going to be turned to unspeakable joy. That's why he came. So why did he weep? In a sense, Jesus was passively responsible for Lazarus' death through his delay. All parties in this story were agreed that if Jesus had only come sooner, Lazarus would not have died. Martha said, Lord, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. And then Mary said, Lord, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even the mourners knew it. They said, surely the one who opened the eyes of the blind could have kept him from dying. Jesus could have prevented Lazarus' death, but he deliberately waited to come until Lazarus was good and dead in the tomb for four days. So why weep now? John says that when Jesus saw Mary and the other mourners, he was deeply moved and troubled in his spirit. Those words mean that Jesus was indignant. Jesus was angry and agitated. Some have suggested that Jesus was angry by Mary's lack of faith in him and the lack of faith of the others. So if he really was angry, if they're right, why then would Jesus turn around and weep? Actually, John is crystal clear about why Jesus wept. Jesus wept because he loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. When the mourners saw Jesus weeping, they rightly concluded, see how much he loves them. Jesus wept because he was moved by Mary's grief. It hurt him to see her hurting so badly. Jesus wept over the human tragedy, the curse of sin that brings about the sting of death. He wept at the hopelessness of humanity in the face of death, the powerlessness of humanity against death. Standing outside of Lazarus' tomb, the author of life was indignant in the malignant presence of the entity called death. He who is life snorted at our enemy, death. And God intends for us to look at Jesus weeping in this story and to conclude the same thing. See how much Jesus loves us. Look at Jesus weeping in this story and realize that even though by not intervening, perhaps God has permitted you to walk through some awful stuff, even though God has permitted you to suffer loss and experience grief, God is not indifferent to your pain. Look at Jesus weeping and realize that you're not merely some kind of pawn to God. 
Even though his bigger purposes in your life, even though his bigger purposes in his world might necessitate your temporary pain, God is not cavalier about that. Look at Jesus weeping and realize that even God, though God knows your final outcome is going to be victory soon enough, he's not unsympathetic to your suffering right now. Beloved, listen to me. Even though God knows that your breakthrough is just ahead, even though God knows that your mourning is just about ready to be turned to dancing, to joy, to laughter, God is not stoic about your present pain. David said he is an ever-present help in time of trouble. Paul said, cast your cares on him because he cares about you. Look at Jesus weeping and realize that God is not aloof. God is not uncaring. He's not detached. God is not unaware. Look at Jesus weeping and realize that he cares profoundly. Brian Kim writes in Magnificent Obsession, What's more amazing in this story? The man who can raise the dead or the God who can weep with his friends? Look at Jesus' indignation and realize that he's angry with the enemy that harasses and terrorizes you. Beloved, listen to me. Let me tell you something. Because you belong to Jesus, Jesus takes it very personally when someone messes with you. When Saul was killing Christians, Jesus knocked him off of his high horse and he said, Saul, why do you persecute me? God said in the book of Isaiah, I will contend with those who contend with you. You know what? You ought to wear a warning t-shirt. You ought to just let people know. You know what? I just want to let you know, before you say what you're about to say, whatever you say to me, you're saying to Jesus, because I belong to him. Look at Jesus weeping and realize that we have a great high priest who sympathizes with us deeply because he himself suffered in every way that we do. Look at Jesus weeping and realize that in a very personal way, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Several years ago, Denise and I had a friend whose young son died in a very tragic accident. When we heard the news, we sat at our dining room table stunned. And something happened. It was as if a portion of that father and that mother's grief was offloaded onto us. And we sat at our table and we wept and we groaned in prayer in the spirit for a few hours. It was as if God had transferred just a portion of their grief onto us so that we could bear it up in intercessory prayer. You know, I can't really describe to you for sure what was happening. In the old days, they would have just said we had a prayer burden from the Holy Spirit, but we felt like something deep was happening. But very clearly, Isaiah says that when Jesus was on the cross in a very real and in a very personal way, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. And not just a small portion of them only, but all of our griefs and sorrows associated with life in this sin-broken world were laid upon him on the cross. The abuse that you suffered... Jesus carried the pain of that on his cross. The rejection, the betrayal, the abandonment that you endured, Jesus carried the pain of that on his cross. The loss that you experienced and the grief that's associated with it, Jesus carried it on his cross. Look at Jesus weeping and realize that he wept for you and he wept for me as much as he wept for Mary. I came across this from a guy called David Mathis the other day, and I liked it. Jesus wept, and in these tears we see that God does not stand aloof to the pains of our existence. He has drawn near. He has taken our flesh and blood. 
He has not called us to a humanity that he himself was unwilling to take. We have not been abandoned to a world into which he was unwilling to enter. We suffer no pain he was unwilling to bear. We have no grief he was unwilling to carry. Jesus wept. He did not consider himself above our agonies, but emptied himself of privilege by taking on our form, being made in our likeness. The very heart of the Christian message is that the happy God so loved our weeping world that he gave his own son to weep with us all the way to the place of utter forsakenness, that whosoever believes in him will not weep forever, but will have everlasting joy. This is our gospel in two words. Jesus wept. Look at Jesus weeping and realize, yes, Jesus loves you. Mary saw Jesus' tears and she knew how much she loved him. But what about us? Jesus has ascended back to the Father. He's sat down at the right hand of the majesty. We can't see Jesus' human tears for us as Mary did. We can't be physically held in his arms as Mary was. How does Jesus' love taught in a Bible story become a caught experience for us? Well, Paul says that it happens by the work of the Holy Spirit. To the Romans, he said, God lavishly pours his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. How does God do that? How does God's love become a caught experience for us? Well, one thing I found is that the Holy Spirit confirms God's love by whispering to us during ordinary moments. I want to share with you just a few of my personal experiences when I have collided with the love of God and the Holy Spirit has helped me catch God's love for me. Amen. One moment happened one day when I was just enjoying my family. You know, as a dad, there are plenty of moments that I just enjoy watching my kids be themselves. They don't have to be doing anything special. They don't have to be doing anything brilliant. In fact, they make me laugh the hardest when they're not brilliant. They don't have to be performing for me. I just enjoy watching them be them. I enjoy watching my kids play. They've invented a few outdoor games. One is called Kick a Bick. The other is called Chomp a Bump. It always ends in tears. Another is called Action Pro. That always ends with injuries. They've invented imaginary worlds and their own languages and imaginary characters. I enjoy watching my kids eat. I enjoy watching my kids interact with each other <clears throat> most of the time. I enjoy watching my kids watch television. I like watching their faces and the flicker of emotion that crosses their face when they react to something they've seen. I like watching my kids sit at the table and work on something, trying to figure it out. I like to watch my kids sleep. Come on, those of you who are moms and dads know what it is to just stand in the doorway and just stare at your kids. And they don't have to be doing anything, just sleeping. But you love them so much because they're yours they're also more beautiful when they're sleeping. <laughs> Some of you might have heard of the tales of our dog, Jack, the mangy beast. <laughs> because poodles are not high strung enough, some cruel person had an idea one day to cross a poodle with a Yorkshire Terrier and we got our dog, Jack. <laughs> Give a poodle a double espresso and that's basically my dog. But, you know, I enjoy watching Jack be a dog. I enjoy watching him run around the yard and do the funny things that dogs do and the funny things that he does in particular. And one day I was standing in my kitchen window and I was watching the kids and the dog all playing out on the lawn and I was just enjoying watching them be them and the Holy Spirit whispered in my ear and he said, you know, God is like that too. And he brought to my mind a verse of Scripture he created all things for his pleasure. 
And I realize that God enjoys watching dogs be dogs just like I do. He enjoys watching lions be lions and whales be whales. And he enjoys watching hummingbirds be hummingbirds and eagles be eagles. And listen to me. God enjoys watching you be yourself. Do you understand that? God actually enjoys you. He takes pleasure in you. And you don't have to be doing anything special. You don't have to be doing anything brilliant. You, you don't have to perform for him. He just enjoys you because you're his. And in that moment that the Holy Spirit whispered to me and reminded me of that verse, I realized that God takes pleasure in me just the way that I as a father take pleasure in my own kids. And even more so because his love is perfect and mine is humanly imperfect. And in a quick moment, I could feel God's love for me. I could feel the father's delight, the father's pleasure, and, and I was freed a little bit from the pressure to perform for God. Just like Paul prayed in Ephesians, I pray for you that by the work of the Holy Spirit, you would know by experience that God takes pleasure in you. David said, God watches you when you're sleeping and he watches you when you awaken. He watches you when you leave the house and he watches you when you come home again. God is familiar with all your ways. God thinks about you all the time and his thoughts about you are preciously good. How does God's love become a caught experience? Second, the Holy Spirit confirms God's love by helping us in times of crisis. Jesus confirmed his love for Mary by comforting her in her time of crisis. He confirmed his love for her by helping her and he does the same for us. You know, I have too many stories to tell you of how God has helped me in moments of crisis. Many times that I have shouted out the name of Jesus and he has rescued me in an emergency. Went to school in the state of Maine. There was lots of ice and snow up there and there were numerous times that I was spared from bad accidents when I shouted out the name of Jesus couple times that my car was spinning, doing 360s, about to hit another car, a tree, go off the road, and I just closed my eyes and shouted the name of Jesus, and I don't know what God did, but when I opened them again, my car was sitting still in the center of the road, facing the direction that I needed to go. At least four times that I've seen them, I've had assistance from angels, and I'm sure that there's been some other times when I haven't seen them told you the other week how I shouted the name of Jesus one night when my dad was having a heart attack and the heart attack instantly stopped. I have too many stories to tell of miracles of provision that I've received when I needed them. See, that's how I know. It's not that I'm unconcerned or nonchalant about it, but that's how I know that God is going to help us finish phase two because my father has never once failed me. When I moved to Springfield, Missouri to start seminary, I used up every last dollar that I had to pay the deposit on my apartment and to get the power turned on. I literally, I had zero dollars left and I had no food. I had absolutely nothing and I knew nobody. So I said, well, Lord, I guess I'm going to fast <laughs> until I find a job and I get my first paycheck. I was looking at a 21-day fast. And I only weighed 140 pounds back then, so I needed a little something to eat. And while I was on my knees praying, there was a knock on my door. And there at the door was a woman from my old church in Philadelphia with about 30 bags of groceries. God sent her from Southampton, Pennsylvania to Springfield, Missouri to bring me groceries and she brought me so much that I fed all the other seminary students that were moving into the building that same week. I fed them for about 10 days. 
You see, every time God helps you in a crisis, every time God comforts you, every time God rescues you, every time God answers your prayers, he is confirming his love to you. Jesus said, not a single sparrow falls to the ground, but your father sees it and he cares and you are much more valuable to him than a sparrow. God cares about you. He cares about your struggles. He cares about your needs. He cares cares in spite of whatever dumb things you've done. He cares about what you're doing now and he cares about what others are doing to you. May the Holy Spirit give you grace to believe in your heart that yes, Jesus loves you. How does God's love become a caught experience for us? Finally this, the Holy Spirit confirms God's love for us while we're worshiping and praying and studying God's word. Worship team, you can come and help me to finish. Beloved, this song is true. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. You see, the true stories in the Gospels teach us that Jesus loves us. And as we read and as we meditate on those stories, the Holy Spirit is at work in our heart convincing us that God loves us now just as much as he loved Mary and the others back then. Two quick stories of times when the Holy Spirit ministered God's love to me while I was studying the scripture and then we're done. One story happened in December of 2014, when I was studying about the humility of Christ that was displayed in the incarnation and in the cross, Paul said Jesus humbled himself and he became a human and he became a servant and he became obedient to death, even death on the cross. The cross was the ultimate expression of the son's humiliation. Do you know that humility is the only character quality that Jesus ever asserted about himself. He said, take my yoke and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. And then Jesus said this, when you learn that I am meek and lowly of heart, you will find rest for your souls. And the Holy Spirit whispered to me as I was reflecting on that scripture. And I finally understood that the humility of God means that I don't have to perform for him anymore. I don't have to try to impress God. In fact, I cannot because our humble God is not attracted to displays of strength, but he's attracted to our brokenness and our neediness. I don't have to prove to God that I'm capable. I only have to confess to God that I can't. God resists the proud, but he gives more grace to the humble. And that revelation of God's love to me in that moment, it was so freeing to me. You see, it is by his love that we really understand the freedom of grace. This whole thing is not about my best efforts. It's all about his goodness. Another encounter I had with God's love happened at the end of last summer when I was studying 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In that passage, Paul is bragging as a spiritual father about his children in the Lord, the Corinthians. Paul sent Titus to Corinth for the first time, and before he left, he bragged to Titus about the Corinthians. He said, Titus, you're going to love those Corinthians. They're the most awesome people. They're the most loving people. They're the most faith-filled, spirit-filled people. You're just going to have a great time. If you know anything at all about Paul's relationship with the Corinthians, the irony is that they had given him nothing but fits. They had not been very compliant children, and they hadn't been very kind at all to Paul. In fact, they had insulted him deeply. But Paul was not being disingenuous in his bragging about them. That was his real father's heart toward his children. And even though they were still sorting out a few issues privately, they were still Paul's pride and joy, and he joyfully bragged on his kids. 
It just happened that that same week that I was studying 2 Corinthians 7 and reflecting on all these things, I had been introduced to that song we sing around here, you're a good, good father. That's who you are. And I'm loved by you. That's who I am. And I was studying these scriptures and that song. It was playing again and again in the background. And the Holy Spirit whispered to me. He said, you know, Glenn, Paul's love for his spiritual children it wasn't his own love. It was the Father's love flowing through Paul. You see, Paul had once had killer breath. The book of Acts says that he breathed out death threats against Christians, which he also carried out. Paul hated Christians, but look at the transformation in this man who now has this bragging love flowing out of him, even when his kids have been a little bit difficult to deal with. And you realize this was not Paul's love. It was the Father's love in him. And I realized when the Holy Spirit whispered that to me, and I'm looking at the Word, and good, good Father is playing, I, I realized in that moment that God loves me that way too. That even though He and I might still be sorting out a few issues privately, nevertheless, He's proud of me, and He brags on me. Can I tell you, only one time do I ever remember my earthly father saying something complimentary about me. My dad was cut from the cloth that there was always room for improvement. Maybe you know the type. And before my dad said something complimentary about me to one of his friends, he said, Glenn, close your ears. As if somehow it might ruin me to hear my own father say something nice about me. And what he said is, Glenn is very entrepreneurial. You know, that was the kindest thing that I ever heard my dad say in my presence. And I realized some of you have never even had that. And when the Holy Spirit whispered to me as I was studying 2 Corinthians 7 and the worship was playing, I realized how much I can be like my earthly father rather than my heavenly father. I realized how quick I am to point out all the areas that need improvement and how stingy I am to hand out praise. And I wept and I asked God to change my heart and to make me more like Him. Listen to me this morning. Do you know that God, your Father, brags about you? It's true. The Bible says that He brags about you to the angels. In fact, honestly, I think they roll their eyes sometimes and say, oh, here he goes again. He's going to get out the photos next. He's going to start showing me photos on his iPhone. There he goes. He brags about you to the heavenly hosts. He brags about you to the various orders of created being. He even brags about you to the devil. It's true. The devil comes to accuse you before God and God doesn't hear a word he says God just says look at my son I love him so much look at my daughter I love her so much she's so beautiful she's so brave and I see all these good things about her and in the ages to come the Bible says God is going to keep on bragging about you to entities that we don't even know exist yet God is going to hold us up and say look at these trophies of my grace look at these beautiful beloved ones look at my bride look at my lover and here is my prayer for you during this Lenten season and beyond my prayer is that you will have a collision with the love of God. My prayer is that God will send you, the Holy Spirit, to whisper God's love to you during ordinary moments so that you would know that you bring God pleasure just being you. That God enjoys you. That God delights in you. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit will confirm God's love to you by comforting you and helping you in times of crisis so that you would know that He cares deeply about your needs, about your stress, about your pain. My prayer for you is that the Holy Spirit will whisper God's love to you while you're worshiping and praying and reading His Word so that you would know that you don't have to perform anymore in order to please God. You don't have to impress Him, and in fact, you cannot. And I pray that you would know that you have a Father in heaven who brags about you. 
he finds the very best qualities in you. And those are the things that he holds forth to all of creation. My prayer for you is that the Holy Spirit will give you strength in your innermost being so that you have the ability to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ and to experience this love in a way that surpasses knowledge. My prayer for you is that you will believe in your heart that yes, Jesus loves you. Would you stand on your feet and would you give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place this morning?